I'm Cesar Delgado from Back Roads of Illinois. I am joining with my castle from Stone X in Kansas City, Missouri for Fertilizer Division. How are you, Mike? Doing well, Caesar. Good to be back with you. I've been enjoying this spring-like weather we've seen for the last couple of weeks. Let's start with the world events and start with trouble in the Red Sea and Middle East. What is the impact on the fertilizer prices for our farmers in Midwest? Yeah, I think first off, it's important to put into perspective just how important the entire Middle East and North Africa region is to the fertilizer industry. Uh, we may not think about the Middle East as being important in the ag space. We typically just think about them in terms of crude oil, the other energy markets. But over half of the entire world's urea exports come from this area. Uh, for example, even here in the States, our number one supplier of urea imports is Qatar. And most of their neighbors in the Arab Gulf are also very important to the industry. Because of that, the biggest risk to the fertilizer market would be a widening, more regional conflict. Uh, you know, like you mentioned in the Red Sea there, we've seen escalations kind of all around the region, uh, with the most notable being in the Red Sea in terms of, uh, you know, commodity space itself, the disruptions that we're seeing to transit because of the attacks by the Iran-backed Houthis over there. Um, thankfully, there's not been a ton of direct impact on the fertilizer side, but it has caused disruptions to shipments of ammonia coming from the Middle East over to North African phosphate producers and going the other direction, shipments of phosphorock and just finished phosphates from North Africa, whether that's Morocco, whoever, over into Asia, whether that's India, Southeast Asian countries. Um, you know, like with all the other commodities having to go through the Suez Canal, through the Red Sea, they're now avoiding the area. They're having to sail all the way around the southern end of Africa. So that's driving up shipping costs. It's causing delays. Uh, you know, kind of just all kinds of headaches through shipments there. It's a very major, you know, transit uh, corridor for a lot of commodities and fertilizers not excluded in that. Uh, the U.S. and U.K. have responded. Obviously, we've seen the strikes back in Yemen, but it's yet to stop them from happening so far. They're still targeting ships, kind of still preventing folks from being able to transit like normally. Uh, obviously, we hope to avoid any further escalation and hope that the conflict ends soon. But the biggest risk to overall nitrogen supply would be a more direct conflict between the U.S. and Iran. Uh, we may not think about Iran when we think about, you know, major traders in the world, but they're actually the world's number five urea exporter as they've kind of figured out how to get around sanctions. Um, the other actual direct impacts that we have seen was initially when the war broke out back in early October, we saw some Egyptian plants have to shut down because they lost their nat gas supply. Uh, Egypt imports a lot of their natural gas from Israel directly. And when the war broke out, they had to shut down the EMG subsea pipeline. So Egypt loses that gas supply, has to turn the plants off. And we saw kind of a short-term spike in urea prices. Thankfully, the markets have you know kind of normalized from there. Yes, we're seeing some firmness. It's not necessarily being driven by that. But the fact that we did see it happen is just kind of a good example of what can happen if things keep escalating. So again, we hope for the fertilizer market's sake that they don't. Um, you know, we like to think of this as a very low probability, high impact risk is kind of how we term it. And again, we hope to see that slowdown in escalations. There's no reason today for us to think that we won't. But just because of how critical this region is to the overall global nitrogen supply, it's something we've got to keep in the back of our minds. Um, but, you know, and that's, again, it's the things that have a huge impact yet. So the issues have been mostly isolated to the Red Sea, and there's not as much fertilizer flowing out of there as there would be on the other side of the Arabian Peninsula. So if you go to kind of that eastern edge of uh, Saudi Arabia, through the Persian Gulf, the Gulf of Oman, those are kind of the areas where you would see a lot more direct impact to fertilizer shipments. So again, our hope here is that, you know, we can kind of minimize that spread. Uh, you know, that's kind of been everyone's fear is things escalating to a broader region, and that would kind of have a more direct impact on fertilizer, especially with the stuff coming from here. Like I mentioned with Qatar, 
Um, they're over there on the eastern side of the Arabian Peninsula. So right now, things are fine. They're still able to come here with no issue. Um, but again, we just hope to avoid any further... Well, it's kind of been firming up here as we get closer to spring. Uh, you know, obviously this good weather is kind of getting us back into the mindset of spring and making us realize that application season was kind of right around the corner, uh, which, you know, feels like a bit of a surprise here in mid-February. We ended last year very tight, uh, specifically on urea. And then even this fall, we had a gigantic fall run uh, on the ammonia side of things. So things kind of are tighter. You know, we kind of depleted the system and need that winter time, that off season, that slow time to kind of rebuild stocks and get them where they need to be. Um, and, you know, obviously had some logistical issues this fall, especially with the low water we saw in the Mississippi. But, you know, things are kind of improving. But, you know, if we do kind of continue to see this nice spring weather and we do get, you know, kind of more consistent warm days and get guys back out in the field sooner, um, you know, it'd be kind of a bit quicker than anticipated. And I think you could see some kind of inland price spikes on, you know, lower availability because of that reason, just because stuff's having to get pulled a little quicker than expected. Would you like to go to tell our audience about the Mississippi River situation for right now alongside with the world events? Yeah, it's uh, thankfully looking a lot better. I mean, we're night and day from where it was this fall when we had the major low water issues on the Mississippi. Thankfully, right now, we've got no low water levels anywhere along the Mississippi River. and We're actually starting to see some barge movement returning. Again, kind of with spring now, feeling like it's just around the corner. Um, right now, it seems like, if anything, the risks are kind of to the higher side. Uh, I mean, you guys in Illinois specifically, there are some areas yeah. on the yeah. Illinois River kind of, kind of, you know, that are near flood stage or in minor flood stage, but nothing crazy just yet. Um, but again, kind of like I mentioned before, as empty as we finished last season and how early it seems like we could be pulling those spring applications forward if this weather holds up, uh, we kind of just need the river to cooperate here, uh, you know, in these next few weeks as we're getting tons into place before the season. Do you have any final thoughts on this issues and demand for fertilizer? Um, you know, as we kind of get into spring here, like I said, it does seem like we're kind of firming up a bit. Uh, the one, I guess, thing I'd say here with obviously with grain prices falling off like they have, it's making affordability not look quite as favorable, especially if we do see prices kind of creep up. Uh, it wouldn't shock me if we see guys kind of backing off on phosphate applications this spring, just because we had a good spring last year. We had a good fall this year. Um, and phosphate is really the one that's still kind of, in my mind, too expensive. We've seen a very major correction to the downside across nitrogen, um, you know, on potash as well. Things are way better priced than they were, you know, a couple of years ago when we were hitting our peaks. And relative to grains, they still look like a pretty good buy here today. But again, the exception to that really is the phosphate side. DAP and BAP are both still very, very expensive, especially, you know, kind of in this environment of grains falling out. Um, you know, at StoneX, we like to look at the two in relation to one another to kind of help, you know, avoid the sticker shock, avoid the emotion of that decision, kind of look at the two as a ratio. Um, and right now, phosphate is just looking a little too expensive, to be honest with you. Thanks for coming, Mike. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Caesar. Thank you to, to yourself. Good luck with uh, all your listeners and uh, the spring season coming up. Hopefully this weather sticks around and we can get out in the field before we know it. This is Mike Castle from Stone X and Fertilizer, a division out of Kansas City. From Back Roads of Illinois, I am Caesar Delgado.